Uh, good day, bonjour et bienvenue from Washington, D.C. I'd like to extend a warm welcome from the Africa Center to our distinguished alumni, friends, and colleagues from nearly 50 countries who have joined us today for this webinar entitled Taking Stock of African Peace Operations, the G5 Sahel Joint Force. My name is Dr. Nate Allen, and I am Assistant Professor of Security Studies here at the Africa Center. I am the Africa Center's faculty lead on peace operations. And this webinar is the second in a series of quarterly webinars we are hosting to discuss successes, challenges, and lessons learned for the African regional peace and security architecture from the African Union authorized ad hoc regional missions. Um, and before we continue our webinar, it's my pleasure to introduce the Africa Center Director, Kate Omquist Knopf, to say a few words. Kate, over to you. Well, thank you, Nate, and to welcome to all of the Africa Center's alumni, distinguished colleagues, and friends. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this program today. The Africa Center serves as a forum for research, academic programs, and the exchange of ideas with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African institutions. We are a Department of Defense Regional Center located at the National Defense University in Washington, DC. We carry out our mission of advancing African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. Accordingly, we seek to generate relevant insights and analysis that informs practitioners and policymakers on topical and emerging security trends and on effective responses to dynamic and complex security challenges. Recognizing that addressing serious challenges can only come about through candid and thoughtful exchanges, the Africa Center provides opportunities for partners to exchange views on shared interests and sound practices. And by exchanging with our African partners, military and civilian, governmental and civil society, as well as national and regional, uh, we hope to reinforce that we all have valuable roles to play in mitigating the complex drivers of conflict and insecurity on the continent today through enduring and capable institutions. This kind of dialogue infused with real world experiences and fresh analysis, we hope provides an opportunity to continued learning and catalyzes concrete actions. So thank you once again for joining us uh, for this conversation today on uh, African peace operations and the G5 Sahel in particular. Uh, we look forward to the discussion and uh, we're so pleased that you're with us. Thank you, Nate, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Kate. Uh, so now to introduce uh, the topic and content of today's webinar. In, in previous webinar series, uh, there were two important points that were brought up that I'd like to highlight that I think are, are very relevant to today's discussion. Um, first, we established that particularly over the past decade, we've seen a trend towards increasing African ownership over peace operations on the continent. From uh, the status of African countries as the world's largest source of troop contributing nations uh, to the increasing role that the African Union and the regional economic communities play in authorizing, providing support to, and mandating uh, peace operations. Um, second, uh, what is remarkable about, about the African model of peace operations is that there really is no fixed approach. Uh, African actors, governments, militaries, have experienced leading in numerous kinds of peace operations, uh, from efforts to support democracy and resolve election disputes in countries such as the Gambia and Comoros, uh, to fighting as terrorism as part of the world's largest peace operation in Somalia, Amazon, to AU-authorized ad hoc regional coalitions um, that we're going to dig deeper in today. Uh, Though this lack of, of template is no doubt a testament to the flexibility and adaptability of African peace operations, it also makes them tricky to evaluate and, and take stock of. And one of the key contributions of this webinar series is to help us better understand the contribution of African-led peace operations on their own terms, as distinct from more exhaustively analyzed UN peacekeeping missions. Um, as I just mentioned, we're gonna be focusing today's webinar on a type of operation known as African Union Ad Hoc Regional Missions. That's the focus of our webinar series that we're gonna conduct over the course of this year. Um, 
These are coalitions of regional actors that have come together to respond to shared regional security challenges and threats. They have each requested and received authorization from the African Union, but they operate outside of the official framework of both the AU and the regional economic communities and, and mechanisms such as the African Standby Force. Uh, they could be characterized as medium-sized as far as peace operations go, compromising typically around 5,000 uh, troops committed predominantly by regional actors, but, but not exclusively. There are three such ad hoc regional missions. They include first, the African Union led regional task force to counter the Lord's Resistance Army uh, in Uganda, which was authorized in 2011 and concluded in 2018. Second, uh, the multinational joint task force in the Lake Chad Basin uh, to counter the Boko Haram insurgency. And finally, the most recent mission, the G5 Sahel Joint Force, which was established in 2017 and will be the topic of our discussion today. It is an AU authorized mission composed of around 5,000 troops from Mali, Chad, Niger, Burkina Faso, and, and Mauritania. Um, its mandate is to fight terrorism and transnational crime, among other things, in, in three border regions of the five participating uh, Sahelian countries. Uh, in carrying out its mission, it receives support from and collaborates uh, with other security forces from each respective nation, uh, MINUSMA, the United Nations Peacekeeping Mission in Mali, and the French-led Operation Barkhane. Uh, for those of you who are interested in a summary of the G5, G5 Sahel Joint Forces Operations activities, as well as those of other regional actors, uh, please see the Africa Center's review of major security activities, which is linked on the readings in today's webinar, and I hope we can get up uh, on, our, on our chat. Um, so, which was just been posted on our chat. Um, so to discuss the G5 Sahel Joint Forces successes, challenges, and lessons learned, and to unpack some recommendations from the G5 Sahel experience for the, Af for the African regional security architecture, I am deeply honored to have with me today two highly knowledgeable experts and distinguished uh, practitioners. Uh, first, and I invite them both to, to turn on their video as I introduce them. Um, first, we have uh, Minister Kamisa Kamara, who is currently serving as a, visit, as a senior visiting expert for the Sahel at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, prior to August 2020, she served at the highest levels of the Malian government, including as Minister Foreign Affair, of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Digital Economy, and Chief of Staff to the former president, Ibrahim Boubacar Keita. Um, she is a widely respected expert on the Sahel here in Washington, where she has served in leadership roles at a number of institutions, published a wide range of political commentary, and been featured on the radio and television. Next, we have General Mohammed Zanagi Seed Ahmed Ali, uh, who is serving as the defense and security expert at the G5 Sahel, a position he has held since 2015. Prior to his post with the G5 Sahel, he was a Brigadier General in the Mauritanian Armed Forces, where he served as head of the Joint Staff Committee and Inspector General. We are also delighted to welcome back General Zanagi as an alumni of the Africa Center. It's always a pleasure to host uh, Africa Center alumni as resource people and speakers, so welcome. Um, so we'll get right into our questions. Our, our first question is gonna go to you, uh, Minister Kamara. Kamara, if, you'd if you could, I'd like you to describe for us the political calculus and context surrounding the establishment of the G5 Sahel and the G5 Sahel Joint Force, which are related entities, but I know they are at times confused. Um, so how did the G5 Sahel come into being and who were the key actors involved in its creation in 2014? And then what led to the subsequent decision to create the G5 Sahel Joint Force in 2017? Minister Kamara, Kamara? Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I would like to first thank uh, the ACSS for having uh, put together this event, which uh, comes at an opportune time. 
as far as the operational questions for peacekeeping in Africa, they are important questions, but the G5 Sahel question is even more important because G5 Sahel questions come back often, whether it is to formulate a foreign uh, policy in America, uh, in the US, or uh, whether it is the EU uh, foreign uh, policy establishment. So I think it is an important question to discuss. And I hope that the different um, perspectives that will be put forward today will be used in the future by the Biden administration in order to truly um, find the right improvements uh, to bring to the American uh, foreign policy in the region. So you said it in your introduction, the G5 Sahel officially started in 2014. Um, under the leadership of uh, the AU and uh, supported by the by Mauritania. It is an intergovernmental um, effort. Uh, it is based out of Nouakchott in uh, Mauritania. And there are two main uh, goals. First, to fight insecurity in the Sahel region. And second, to carry out development actions in order uh, to improve the region and to tackle the issues that might have led uh, to uh, terrorism or might have um, uh, fed terrorism. So we can't uh, confuse the two things. We have the joint force and we have the G5 Sahel. The joint force was set up in 2017 with heads of states from Burkina Faso, Mali, Mauritania, and Chad. They officially, and Niger, they officially launched this um, transporter joint force, which is called the G5 Sahel joint force. Its creation was set up by the uh, AU uh, Security uh, Peace Council. The uh, joint force, as I said, is that the uh, joint force has as its mission to um, work on fighting terrorism, organized crime, transport organized crime, and the traffic, uh, human trafficking. Its first operation uh, started in November 2017 with the Burkina Faso uh, military and Niger military and 2021, and the general can confirm that or not, uh, the joint force uh, truly uh, met its uh, full operational capacity with 5,000 troops on the ground uh, amongst seven battalions with uh, different areas, the west, the center, and the east. Its creation to this day led to uh, 17 joint operations, which is extremely encouraging. I must also uh, remind you that the G5 Sahel, as an intergovernmental um, joint force, when it was first set up, had a development force. And at this point, it needs to integrate the different countries in the Sahel and common air companies need to be set up. Dans le domaine sécuritaire, au-delà de la création de la force conjointe, le G5 Sahel a mis en place un collège militaire en Mauritanie. Donc, les soldats du, du G5 Sahel y reçoivent des formations de plusieurs semaines, euh, formations qui sont censées euh, ben les, mettre, les remettre à niveau et leur donner une culture commune afin qu'ils soient euh, plus efficaces euh, sur le terrain. Je terminerai euh, mon propos par, par ceci. Euh, il est trop tôt pour, pour évaluer les résultats et les perspectives de, pour la force du G5 en ce qui concerne la stabilisation du Sahel. Rappeler également que le G5 a vu le jour il y a moins de, de 10 années et se rappeler également que la nature du paysage euh, sécuritaire dans lequel le, le, le G5 Sahel et sa force conjointe évoluent est extrêmement complexe. Pour vous donner une idée, euh, j'ai lu un rapport euh, récent d'un think tank néerlandais 
euh, qui disait que il y avait plus de 20 mouvements armés. There was more than 20 movements operating in the Sahel, so it's very difficult to differentiate uh, excuse, various excuse, minister. We, we had briefly lost the translation. It just came back online, so you can you can continue. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Donc je ne sais pas combien de euh, à quel moment vous. So I don't know exactly when we you lost me, but uh, just to say that it's too early to analyze the results and perspectives of the G5 cell force. I would like to remind here that the security landscape of uh, the where are operating the G5 Sahel and its uh, joint force is very complex. I would like to talk a uh, recent uh, report that says that 20 armed groups are operating in the Sahel. It's very difficult to differentiate the various groups, the terrorists and the ones who are inspired by uh, <coughs> a, <gre> uh, <coughs> a problem with uh, their government or not. Another point I'd like to raise here is that we are a tendency to think that the security problems of the Sahel started in 2000 and in 2001, as well as, uh, all, as, well as all the Um, the weapon that uh, came with the uh, disappearance of uh, Gaddafi. So I would like to remind here that it's a problem that's dating to the 80s, even uh, 2000s, where we, we saw uh, trafficking with uh, drugs from uh, uh, Latin America that made the sale some kind of a route, a uh, favorite itinerary for the drug traffickers of all types, which made the region not very fertile for the, actually very fertile for the terrorist groups. And I will stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Minister Kamler, for that clear mm -hmm. overview of both the G5 Sahel and the G5 Sahel uh, joint force, as well as that very broad kind of historical perspective on It, these problems are, are very, very deeply rooted and that the, are, are these solutions, especially the joint forces, as a relatively recent development. Uh, so now uh, over to, we're going we're gonna, to uh, give you a similar question, General Zanagi. You have been with the G5 Sahel from the near, nearly beginning, serving in a role that supports its defense and security activities. So I greatly, greatly appreciate your perspective as both a defense expert and a military officer. Could you explain the G5 Sahel Joint Forces objectives from a military perspective, and, and also talk a little bit about how these objectives have informed the forces organization and structure. General Zanagi. Merci, merci beaucoup. Thank you, thank you very much. I hope you're hearing me. You said it, uh, this is uh, Minister, this is Camera. You showed the landscape in a general way and uh, security level as well as uh, political and history. Because we just said that the security problem in the Sahel does not day to Gaddafi dates to way before in the 2000s. The Sahel region became a ground for insecurity, all types of traffic, and uh, terrorism developed because it has it has developed all these uh, trafficking uh, networks. It got all this money from the various traffic, and it pose itself as a regulator of all these and the main actor against all populations of the Sahel and against governments of the Sahel regions. Now, to go back to your question, what were the objectives of the creation of the joint force? I'm going to try to limit myself to the objectives, the military objectives 
as well as tactical and strategic ones of the creation of this military force. Mrs. Minister, you said earlier that first the G5 is not only a joint force, but it's first a development organization because it has three pillars, one including one security and defense. Secondly, it's not the only tool for defense and security in the hands of the G5 cell. She talked about the defense college. We also have a college for security in Bamako. We also have a center for strategic studies in Ouagadougou. We also have, we also have soon uh, a superior school of, pol of uh, police in Chad. And we also have another information center in Yame. So to go back to the objectives, during this uh, period of the 2000s, even before, until the disappearance of uh, Gaddafi, the terrorists took their time in order to appropriate entire areas in Sahel. And due to the decision centers and the precarity of the government services, and due to the limited forces, defense forces, and started uh, working in uh, transborder regions. They occupied these uh, transborder regions. They showed the way. They used the populations either by paying them or by threatening them with death. And the various uh, states went left and it became now micro states within our states, therefore, the first uh, objective of the joint force was to get back the transborder areas. Uh, it meant uh, pursuing the terrorists and the armed bands, the armed groups in the transborder zones areas, and to bring back security. We wanted to make secure the government services or state services and to give populations a sense of security. Before the start of this mission, the defense forces had to leave gradually and let the internal security forces to act because they are more adapted to these, because we use the defense forces through necessity. That's our vision of these objectives. Even with the diversity of training of the various units of the force and the composition of the various forces in our countries. So these were evaluated to be realistic and uh, national forces were able to help qualitatively and quantitatively. They know that they cannot come, uh, they cannot eliminate terrorism by themselves. The threat is not covering only the Sahel countries. Therefore, the conditions, the requirements of our heads of state when created this joint force in 2017 in Bamako was very clear. First, a mandate, a solid mandate from the UN. Second, funds, a durable funds, and Third, the application of the UN chart. I believe I answered that the first part of your question. Yes, uh, yes, indeed. Thank you very much for that very comprehensive uh, response. Um, and I think now we have a really, really good handle on, first and of now, all, how the G5 Sahel came into being, and second of all, what some of its main, uh, uh, how, for structure and, and the like has, has been. Que cela veut dire pour la structure? Um, I'd now like to turn to the questions surrounding question uh, the tangible contributions the joint force made to the stated objectives of fighting terrorism objectives de lutte and countering transnational organized crime in the Sahel. Um, and again, we'll go back to you, uh, Minister Kamara, on this one. Uh, Minister Kamara, uh, in your view, what have the G5 uh, plaît, plaît, uh, uh, 
Oh. Okay, le début, so le début de son intervention n'a pas été interprété en français. Okay, thank you very much. I'm actually going to go back and repeat some of the what I said earlier because I think we were having some some interpretation problems. So basically, what what I said well, was that problem um, à l'interprétation. Okay, okay. Um, so I think are we are we good now, Jean-Louis Are we good on French? Can you hear me? All set. Oui, maintenant, maintenant, on vous entend. Okay, thank you. Now we hear um, you. So, um, thanks to both of you for that, I think, really great background on how the G5 Sahel came into being, what its objectives are, what its force structure is. Um, and I now like to move our conversation from getting a basic understanding of the G5 Sahel Joint Forces origins and objectives to its successes and challenges. Uh, so, the first question I'm going to direct to you, Minister Kamara. Um, in your view, what have been the G5 Sahel Joint Forces successes and challenges uh, in, in countering terrorism and, and organized crime on the border regions, as, as General Zanagi uh, very, I think, nicely laid out? And, and in particular, how would you characterize the contributions of the G5 Sahel Joint Force as distinct from what is now a pretty clouded security space, including uh, the UN MINUSMA and the French Operation Barkhane, not to mention the efforts of individual governments? So. Uh, Minister Kamra, over to you. Uh, merci beaucoup pour, uh, pour cette Thank question. you very much for this question, which is very important and complex as well. General Zagui and myself explain in which context the G5 was created, and you mentioned it. The G5 cell does not work by itself. It's part of a whole within which you have MINUSMA, which is the peace operations of the UN in Mali, and also the Barkhane operation, which is a French operation born from the Serval operation of 2013, which became Operation Barkhane, which is now one of the biggest operations, uh, military operations of France uh, abroad. So G5 is part of this whole, and in order to start with the challenges of the G5 Sahel, although it exists, I don't know if I can use the adjective organic, meaning there was a lack of security in this zone, in this area, and uh, G5 Sahel countries said we need it in order to survive, we need to put together this organization. However, this organization is located within a hall where you have uh, MINUSMA, which has a significant uh, means, and also Barkhane operation that works with, I believe, 600 million euros per year. So compared to the G5 Sahel uh, budget, these are two giants who are working with G5 Sahel. Now, to go back on the mandate of Bark Barkan, of MINUSMA, and of uh, G5 Sahel, those different mandates, I think that they complement each other. Uh, the mandate of the G5 Sahel uh, Joint Force goes beyond Barkan's mandate. It includes fighting against terrorism and transborder uh, crime. That mandate also includes uh, taking charge of operations for humanitarian needs or development. And it also includes restoring uh, the authority of the state in the G5 Sahel uh, countries. Barkhane, on the other end, is really um, has it, its aim to fight terrorism. Bakan is involved in different uh, patrols uh, with the Malian, uh, Chadian uh, troops and other troops in the area. Barkan is involved in uh, uh, information gathering uh, in uh, order to fill the gap when the government is not there. And despite all of these activities, uh, the uh, French um, insist that the priority is to fight against terrorism for Barkan, that the operations uh, are there in order to eliminate jihadist um, leaders in the region. The MINUSMA has as its goal to support the uh, peace agreement 
to protect the civilians and to support the efforts of the Mali authority in order to stabilize the country. I understand that I need to slow down in order for the interpreter to do her job. Last point, well, not the last point, but it is an important point nonetheless. We need to recognize that the creation of the G5 Sahel Joint Force represents in and of itself an exceptional progress in terms of security cooperation in the region. This presents an opportunity to consider that these issues might be taken over by uh, the Sahel countries. Even if the uh, G5 uh, improved the uh, coordination that exists currently between the different countries in the region, we need to still remember that the G5 Sahel is a player. It is one of the stakeholders amongst others, and we need to know that. I uh, love the G5 Sahel, but it is one stakeholder amongst others. There are other operations that are bilateral and multilateral, and they are currently present in the Sahel. There was a security analyst who even used the uh, phrase not too long ago saying that in the Sahel region, there is sort of a bottleneck uh, in terms of security, meaning that we have many stakeholders, many buyers, many trainers in the region. So I don't know if I answer your question when I say so, but in terms of successes and challenges of the G5 Sahel, the question of funding truly is a question that comes back often. The President Isufu, who used to be the president of Niger, was the leader in these issues, and he really tried to convince the UN to uh, include the G5 Sahel uh, under Chapter 7 of the Charter. I'm not convinced that uh, putting the G5 Sahel under Chapter 7 uh, will enable regular financing and um, predictable financing, but it gives it international recognition, which means that it can get a more fluid financing, more regular financing. And that's what I wanted to say for now. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Kamara, uh, for that really great uh, overview of the G5 Sahel's relations with other forces and, and some of its successes and challenges, particularly in terms of financing. Uh, General Zanagi, I'd like, as, as somebody who's been involved in the G5 Sahel for a very, very long time, if you can give us a bit more of an internal and granular perspective on the challenges and successes of the G5 Sahel's joint force over time. So, so what, in your view, has been the G5 Sahel Joint Forces' main successes and main strategic challenges? And what internally have force commanders working with the Secretariat and the political leadership done to address some of these challenges as they've arisen? Thank you. I would like to go back on what I said earlier, the creation of the joint force when the heads of state uh, defined the conditions for the creation of this uh, force, but uh, faced with the threat, faced with the uh, progress of terrorism in the region, the states didn't wait for those conditions. They actually just um, went ahead without waiting. And they constituted the uh, seven battalions with equipment and based on the three different uh, zones that were uh, mentioned earlier by uh, Mrs. Uh, the Minister. And the 8th Battalion is currently deployed in the Chad, in the center, between Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso. Each of our countries uh, immediately um, contributed 10 million euros to start the battalion's work. In terms of a strategy, we elaborated the strategy uh, together with all the countries. All the command posts were set up in the different zones, as well as the uh, command posts, and everything is working normally. 
the joint force, um, each operation is being paid for the joint force. So the uh, we paid quite a bit because we are at the 20th operation. The international community also was mobilized in order to help the joint force. And the European Union was uh, quite involved as well and gave uh, the most uh, financing to the joint force. Certain countries uh, from Europe and other countries as well contributed. The different commands tackled the work of the joint force and planned and executed operations in the different zones. These operations became uh, bigger and bigger, and the results are starting to be felt, especially in the center, in the central zone, which uh, always was a threat to the region. So uh, to summarize what I said, the creation of the joint force first relied on international um, aid, but then when we were faced with the threat, we had to invest our own means to focus on uh, anti-terrorism. So over the four years, we have to remember that uh, the decision was made in 2017 to uh, make this uh, joint force official. So over four years, it really is difficult to create uh, something from nothing, to get the equipment, to train, to create the uh, command post and to uh, set it up on the field and to, at the same time, um, set up operations. And it, in the end, it is a good thing because without that decision, I believe that terrorism would have been even more damaging to the region. In terms of the objectives, strategic objectives, um, I am not sure that they have yet been met by the joint force, even though some have been, but if all had been, they would be the end of the war, but many tactical objectives were met, such as um, get, uh, taking over entire zones, neutralizing certain terrorist uh, leaders, uh, securization of the central zone, There is still some scaling up and operations are becoming, becoming more diversified. We need to note the presence of partner forces, as um, the minister said earlier, the presence of Barkan, Takuba, and MINUSMA. The European missions of the uh, European Union as well uh, should be noted. They are extremely reliable partners present on site. The minister said earlier, cited someone who said that there was sort of a bottleneck or traffic jam of forces present in the area. And um, I'm not quite sure that it's a traffic jam, but uh, many forces are present. So it requires cooperation, coordination at a very high level, and also a lot of means and resources. And so I don't know if I answered exactly uh, to everything. So you can ask me if I need to uh, be a little more precise, but I do believe that I answered overall in terms of objectives and challenges. So I will stop now. Thank you, and, and absolutely, I actually think we'll have plenty of time to unpack more of these successes and challenges uh, in the Q&A, already looking at some of the questions that have been asked in the chat. Um, I encourage uh, our audience members to begin to think about the questions they want to ask, because we're getting close. Um, one more uh, question to both of you, however, before we begin the Q&A, um, and I'd like to, if you could briefly address this, because I'd like to leave ample time, because we're getting uh, a lot of questions. So. Um, you know, we, we've, I think, have a pretty good overview now of what the G5 Sahel Joint Force is, how it came to be, some of its main successes and challenges. What do both of you think are the key lessons to be learned from the G5 Sahel uh, Joint Force experience for the African Union and other uh, regional actors? And I, to switch things up a little bit, uh, this time, uh, General Zanagi, why don't we start with, with you? 
as far as the lessons um, to be uh, taken out of this G5 Sahel um, initiative, uh, I think there are many. First of all, the creation of this force is the proof that when, when there is political will, you can see that these five countries um, gathered their resources, which sometimes were very few, in order to fight against terrorism and insecurity. So that's the first lesson. So it is possible. When you have political will, you can get results, even when resources are limited. We need to always count on your own means and resources. International aid should only come as a plus. I think that's basically connected to what I said earlier. Uh, we need to adapt the structures to the threat and to the terrain. You had the example of the transporter force because that is a very important example. The G5 Sahel joint force uh, studied the threat and adjusted things. We mentioned that most of the threat comes from the transborder area. And many people ask, why is the G5 Sahel Joint Force transporter, why isn't it um, focused on certain areas? It is precisely because it is the transborder areas that give rise to the threat. And this is where the threat is present. So we uh, set up that structure, which is adapted to the threat and to the terrain. And that is a very important lesson to draw. Fourth, I think that the peace and security architecture from the African Union should not rely on the big regional um, groups. I think that something that is more focused in one region, such a sub-region like the G5 Sahel, is uh, more useful. I think that securization and um, durability of or sustainability of financing is also very important. We should never uh, put troops in operations without securing uh, financing first because otherwise the results might be the opposite of what we are looking for. And the sixth lesson, I think that the autonomy of the command chain and of the intelligence chains are essential in order to succeed in peacekeeping operations and commands in general. The Air Force is also a vector that's very important. We are lacking this, and it's a big handicap for our joint force. Therefore, I draw from that that these forces in the Sahel and uh, peace operations in general must have an autonomy in terms of the aerial forces. So that's a bit of the lessons to be drawn. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Minister Kamara, over to you. What are your lessons? Alors, je, je suis avec, uh, les I agree with all the lessons that were mentioned by General Znagi. I would like also to add that the security matters are better delivered or at least taken over by national entities and regional entities. The G5 Sahel depends a lot on the foreign operations that we mentioned earlier, but also we need to remind also that G5 Sahel is an organization that is born after the survival instinct, I would say, of the Sahel countries which realized that they needed to appropriate their own security. So it's an African solution to an African problem. And I would like to go back to what I said earlier 
about security, saying that it's better taken over by these uh, regional institutions because they are accountable to their government, their population, when it comes to human rights, management of funds as well. And also from there, I would like to add what the G5 Sahel is asking the international community, which is not only assistance in terms uh, of finances, but also to invest in security, the collective security and regional security. The Western countries uh, have NATO, for example, which is an organization uh, from which uh, G5 could learn a lot, but G5 is not ready to disappear tomorrow. And, uh, countries like uh, United States, the European Union, uh, France included, included, they have to invest in this security, this regional security, because sooner or later these matters of security, if they are not taken over or taken seriously in Sahel, and if the necessary investment is not done, therefore we will pay the cost and the heavy one in a few years. I will stop here, thank you. Thank you very, very much. We will now turn to our formal question and answer uh, question. I encourage participants who have not already done so to please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen and submit your written questions for the panelists. You may submit your question in any language you like, and I will try to convey as many questions as we as our time will allow. We already have uh, many, many questions, actually. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to group this into two or three rounds of questions to kind of close off. Our, our webinar. I'll probably do four or five questions around, and then I'll, I'll go back and forth between our two panelists and ask them to respond to whatever uh, question uh, they feel most qualified and comfortable responding to, with the hope that we will get every question addressed. Uh, so first, we have a question that, you know, the G5 support, G5 cell joint force and its visibility adds a somewhat militaristic dimension to international action. It's a question, uh, and, and oftentimes, you know, that military has, uh, 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 doesn't often seem to be, the population doesn't often seem to benefit from uh, military action. So the question is, how can the joint force better take into account populations and, and build confidence between the people and the state, given that it, its focus is a military mission that at times uh, alienates uh, the, the population? Um, the, the second uh, question uh, we have is um, what is the added operational and tactical value at the military level and particularly um, what is the state of affairs versus the, the joint forces uh, police component? How is that, how is setting up that component going? I think Joan Mzanagi are probably best addressed to answer that, but Minister Kamar has any, any remarks that that'd be fine. Uh, next we have um, um, uh, what, uh, what steps have been taken to ensure that what happened in Niger at Terra uh, doesn't happen again uh, through the efforts of the G5's held joint force. So whoever answered that question, take a little bit of background on, on what happened at, at Terra and in, 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 at Terra in responding to that, that question. I think it was a pretty big uh, operational and security failure. And there have been uh, a number of those over the course of the, the G5 Sahel's existence, including the attack on the headquarters at, at Savare in, in 2018. And then uh, finally, for, for this round of questions, um, uh, I'd like to ask um, uh, what, uh, so, so the, the Joint Force has really recently activated its civilian casualty identification, tracking and analysis cell, um, with a congested battle space with independent chains of command, uh, what kind of mechanisms are in place for the sharing of information, which allows to effectively identify forces involved in potentially uh, civilian harm. So again, getting at this question of how do we not alienate uh, the population. Um, so we'll start with those questions. Um, why don't we go uh, to you, Minister Kamara, first. Uh, you don't have to address all of them, just, just whatever questions you felt. Uh, you're most qualified or, or would like to like to address. Okay, so I'll, I'll respond. So I'll respond in English. Am I? Yeah, I, I have the right language. Okay. Um, so the most of the questions that you that were asked were, you know, tactical and strategic questions, but I would like to respond um, regarding the, uh, um, the question of 
military operations of the G5 Sahel benefiting uh, citizens in, in the region. I think um, what, what needs to be communicated to um, the civilians of these um, uh, uh, countries is that the, and well, I shouldn't say anti-terrorism, but military operations or security operations in the region is really a long-term um, game. It's a long-term effort to that will directly go um, to benefit the, the population of, of this uh, region. Um, if, if you don't have security in the region, uh, you cannot possibly attract investments. Um, it is very difficult for even the state to um, improve infrastructure or um, make sure that uh, government agencies or, or government institutions are present in, in those uh, regions. So I think there, there is a lot of um, uh, awareness building that needs to happen when it comes to um, the G G5 Sahel military operations. We've seen in countries like Niger and Mali, a lot of anti-foreign forces sentiment that I think do stem from the lack of communication that um, has been uh, the case in, in the region where governments have difficulties explaining why certain military operations are conducted in this region. So I think there's a lot of, of communications effort and that can def definitely improve this relationship between the population and, and the military. Thank you very much, uh, General Zanagi, uh, over to you. Yeah. Well, Merci. thank you. On my end, I would hope, uh, I hope I heard all the questions and mainly, and I would like to try. There is sometimes uh, big questions, how the joint force can be trusted by the population. The joint force is not only a military force, that's coming to hit on terrorists. It also has a mission to f make the population feel secure. And uh, it uh, has to allow the state services to intervene and to operate in the free zone and in order to give uh, trust to the populations. In war operations, you cannot always give a uh, carte blanche to the military and tell them, oh, you are charging the police of administration, everything. No, we cannot do that. But uh, when it comes to our joint force, it's here to, to deliver operations, whether civilian or military, to help populations where she's present. But it's also monitored because there's a conformity a uh, cater that is monitoring our joint force. And we also have a police component that's very important to monitor and to monitor the actions of our joint force. So uh, the police component today is very present in all sectors, all areas of our joint force. It's also present in battalions. It has two elements, one element with gendarmes who are working with the units, even during military operations, and also a civil element, a civil police that is getting gathering all the information on the various infractions against the civilian uh, population, but also the wounded enemies the wounded, who have been captured. And so this police component is informing the justice department because it is also a judicial pillar that's attached to this police element. All this to give, uh, to make sure that the population are trusting. Also, there were some, uh, I know that there's been some reports where some uh, units of the joint force in some realms, but to be truthful, it's not, uh, it's, it has not been proven. The joint force is one of the most monitored forces when it comes to civil rights 
and respecting uh, well, these civil rights, so it, it doesn't do what it wants. And on top of it, there are also civilian and military actions with the populations where it is uh, operating. The question about the added value of the military operations, I believe that the problem in the region, uh, multiples are security problems, but as but these security problems are also added to governance, uh, development, uh, economical, and other. The development problems cannot be managed only when there is security. These are intertwined, so the military operations are made first to free the areas occupied by the enemy to bring security and for the state to come back and to deliver the state services in order to be able to do their, their mandate and in order to, to the populations to be trustful. The defense unity of the joint force are not going to be deployed constantly and forever in these areas. Like I said, if security is there, if the populations are secure if the state coming is coming back if the security is installed there therefore the forces will uh, leave and uh, go back to their uh, usual mission of uh, foreign uh, defense okay what is being done for what happened uh, in niger not to happen uh, again i don't understand what's happening in niger and what is the question about this in niger we had the democratic elections. It had, it was well and good. There were a lot of attacks in the border Niger Mali, and the joint force was operating there in Niger Mali Burkina Faso transborder areas. And I believe that the intensity of the operations went down a lot. I don't know who as if. Uh, I would like the person who asked uh, that question to specify, to be more specific of ideas. Is it talking about the military operations? I believe that the attacks have uh, lowered in the Mali-Niger uh, border, and it's a way to use our joint force, and I believe it has strengthened, and the joint force is playing a big role, and the intensity of the attacks has uh, lowered. When we're talking about, uh, uh, if you want to be more specific with your question, please say it. Someone said there was a lot of failures of the operations and other. I believe there was no big failure of the operations, but there is a lack of communication. We know that. And we have lacks, we have flaws, and one of the flaws is communication communication, the communication vector, we don't master it and we are not using it very well. And we have to communicate better what we're doing because I know that our joint force does a lot of good, more good than bad. And it's very well accepted by populations wherever it is operating. Therefore, maybe the communication is not uh, done. Unfortunately, it's a handicap. In terms of information uh, sharing, uh, if it has to do with military information sharing, I think that we are moving forward, we are changing uh, with this new uh, Center for Intelligence that we have set up. If it has to do with other uh, communication, it is true that in terms of the press, there is an issue. Um, I can uh, attest to that. In terms of the importance of the uh, action uh, area of the joint force and contact with the population, I can only rejoice of the relationships that we have with the population. This does not mean that there aren't uh, some issues here and there uh, once in a while. It is inevitable. You, When you drive on the highway, you can't um, avoid all possibility that you might have an accident. But the reality is that the G5 Sahel forces do protect the populations uh, and there is a good relationship. They uh, trust because they used to be terrorized by the terrorists. That's all I have to say for now. 
Okay, thank you very, very much. Um, I think we have time for probably one more round of questions. And again, we have a lot of them. Um, one, one consistent theme coming up in, in all of the, in many of the questions, I see five or six kind of along this regard, concerns the G5 Sahel and the G5 Sahel joint force relationships with other regional bodies and, and states. Uh, something you alluded to, I think, in some of your remarks, uh, Minister Kamar, about the necessity of kind of integrating um, all of these peace operations into kind of broader regional uh, frameworks. So in particular, we have um, a question from one of our, our partners uh, in the African Union about how, how uh, the, um, the G5 cell joint force could and should integrate its operations under uh, ECOWAS. Uh, we also have, so I'd like for you both to specifically address that. Um, we also have some other questions concerning um, you know, what happens when, as we're seeing, some of these terrorist groups begin to move, uh, conduct uh, operations on the border regions of, of countries that are not necessarily in the, the G5 Sahel, but might be threatened countries such as Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana. Um, should, they, should they be included or not? What's, what are sort of the next uh, steps there? Um, um, and, and another kind of related question about, you know, the, the, the G5 Sahel being a pretty clearly French West African speaking initiative. And there's this question over how does it potentially integrate some of what it's doing with the English speaking uh, Sahelian West African countries like Senegal, uh, like, like Ghana. And then finally, and I, I think this is probably just gonna take us to the end of our, our time because there's a lot of really, really fascinating questions, a lot of interest, but only so much time. Uh, I, there's this question of, of the drawdown, right? Um, what what happens, uh, it, it is the plan for the French eventually to withdraw from uh, the Mali and the Sahel and then turn over uh, the, uh, the operations to G5 Sahel or other regional forces? What, what does that drawdown look like? Um, is it feasible? Um, is it not gonna compromise operational security? Um, so I think, I think I'd love for you to get your take on, on both kind of those series of questions. I think it's a good place to kind of uh, finish up our, our question and answer uh, session. So um, let's let's go to uh, Minister uh, Kamra first, and then we'll we'll have General Zanagi conclude. Thank you. So as you were speaking, I was actually reading some of the questions in in the chat, and yes, there are a lot of uh, very interesting questions. Um, so I will I will start by saying that you know the Sahel region um, is is not these these five countries that were were talking about. It goes from literally from Senegal uh, to the west to all the way to Eritrea on in the east. Um, but the, the, the reason these five countries decided to, to come together is that they have, um, they can communicate well, they have the same types of uh, climatic issues, structural issues, uh, same uh, culture, and also um, some of uh, the structural difficulties that you'll find in, in Mali or in Niger, you'll also find them in, in Chad and Burkina. So it was almost a natural um, way for them to, to, to come together to combat this uh, issue of terrorism in, in the region. But in reality, the Sahel is much bigger than these five countries that we are talking about. So there is definitely an overlapping of, um, of efforts in the region. I don't think it's a bad thing. Some of the, um, the, the members of the G5 Sahel are also members of the ECOWAS. And um, as the ECOWAS is, uh, as, as is, its, names, uh, its name indicates, an economic community of West African states, it has uh, a political clout and a history um, that the G5 Sahel doesn't have. So the G5 Sahel doesn't necessarily work in silo since its members are also, some of them are also part of, of, of the ECOWAS. There is this, um, I think, sharing of intelligent ex experience um, and, and also leadership that we're seeing between these different uh, regional organizations. So it's not as messy as it, as it looks. Um, the question about coastal countries, is something that um, is new to me. I've, I've heard it multiple times, um, you know, that the G5 Sahel needs to also look at countries like Ghana, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Togo, um, which also could uh, in, in, the, in the next few years also be the center of 
um, terrorist threat. I think it's important to look at them, but really the urgency right now is really the, the, the Sahel region. Um, talking about strategies, I saw also a question saying, well, but um, does, does the D5 really have a, a strategy and it should have a strategy before um, going on the ground? You have to understand that there is this urgency that is there. General, as Nagi did mention it, the G5 did not wait for approval from anybody to go on the ground and take care of the problems that were, uh, that were at play. And the urgency of the situation uh, makes it that while you have your soldiers on the ground, maybe a strategy is being uh, defined and also the situation evolves so quickly that the strategy needs to be adapted on an everyday basis. So I, I don't think that it's, it's a fault in the way that the uh, Sahel military operations are conducted, but it, it's really important to understand that it's a new organization, um, uh, that it is doing a thousand things at the same time, and that the security landscape of the region it is operating in is very, very, very difficult. Talking about French withdrawal, maybe General Snarky can, can talk about that. But I uh, heard on the radio this morning that um, French MPs recently published a report on Operation Barkhane, saying that Operation Barkhane needs to change the way it has been conducting business in the Sahel region, that Operation Barkhane needs to start negotiating with terrorist groups which France has been totally opposed to. And then the second was that uh, Barkhan needs to more clearly um, uh, support its operations with national militaries, which according to that report hasn't been the case up until now. So I think that really the French are looking at how Operation Barkhan can gradually uh, draw down and um, I guess develop an exit strategy. But to be realistic, I don't think that this is going to happen anytime soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, General Zanagi. The last word will we'll go to you. Merci encore une fois. Thank you again. It is difficult to talk about these regional issues and to talk about these uh, geostrategic issues after uh, the minister, she has more experience in these areas of international relations and regional relations um, than I do. But I uh, still will try to give you a little bit of a uh, point of view from my experience as a practitioner and to try to answer these questions. As far as the relationships of the G5 Sahel and the surrounding states and other entities, this question was asked and is often asked, but many people don't understand that the G5 Sahel is part of the greater um, continent, of the continent, even if it is not recognized as a regional organization by the AU, the AU does deal with this organization ever since it was created as if it had been there um, for a long time, because it is almost a natural thing. You can see the aura that G5 Sahel has had over uh, these few years. There are organizations that have been there for 50 or 40 years and that still don't uh, have uh, the same clout. And so, you know, everybody is now working with them. So it's, I think, a question of homogeneity. It is the small number of countries that make up the G5 Sahel that makes it so that it is such a strong organization because these countries are together. They uh, are similar in terms of poverty, in terms of governance, in terms of um, politics, in terms of geography, and they are all faced with the same threat. So they gathered, they are very uh, 
poor resources to work together. So there is great harmony and there is great harmony as well with ECOWAS, as was mentioned earlier, even it is on, if it is only three countries that belong to ECOWAS, uh, as you know, not all of them do. Uh, Mauritania has um, agreements with ECOWAS, but the G5 Sahel works uh, very well with ECOWAS. In fact, the force in West Africa uh, started to scale up to help G5 Sahel. We have follow-up structures in common and we work uh, very closely with ECOWAS in terms of security and sometimes even in terms of uh, economic issues because ECOWAS um, was involved with the three uh, countries in the center economically. And we also work with the African Union. The African Union gave a mandate to our post and supports us. In fact, the African Union promised that it will send 3,000 troops to support the G5 Sahel force. This is something that we are working on. And so with these 3,000 troops, it means that the AU judged that uh, the G5 Sahel force was, uh, um, was uh, pertinent. In terms of uh, the countries, uh, will more countries be included in the G5 Sahel? I am not sure that it will be the case directly, but still the G5 Sahel can operate uh, with those countries and they can work together. These countries can actually collaborate with the G5 Sahel, just like we do with ECOWAS, as I mentioned earlier. The terrorists, of course, are trying to break through beyond uh, where they are. Terrorists are trying to build a highway from the Gulf to the Mediterranean. And of course, some of the coastal countries will indeed um, be affected by terrorism and the population needs to work closely with the G5 Sahel force and the G5 Sahel in general and with the ECOWAS as well. Someone mentioned the French initiative uh, what about English speaking uh, countries? I think it just um, happened that these uh, G5 Sahel countries uh, are French speaking, but it uh, does not exclude the English speaking countries as well. In fact, the terrorists don't exclude the English speaking countries at all. And uh, I think that we are all Africans, even all West Africans. And if we don't work together, we will never win against uh, this plight. And so there is not an opposition between English speakers and the French speakers. We are all Africans. We are all West Africans. We are all threatened. We all have limited means and resources. And so I think that we need to truly support each other at the regional level. Uh, we need to cooperate as states and at all levels in, other, in order to stop the threat. As far as the French, um, and whether or not they uh, draw back and what will happen. I think that we are not at that point yet. First of all, uh, Bakan is not uh, ready to uh, leave. And it's not just France. France is there because of the urgency of the situation. They are there to help us. Imagine that Serval had never been there in 2012. You know, France truly was uh, the firefighter that stopped the fire and Serval evolved and became Barkhane, which has a mandate over the entire G5 Sahel uh, subregion and that took over uh, op the operations in a very um, important manner. And without Barkhane, I don't believe that the situation would be where it is. To my knowledge, the French people, and I heard the various reports, they are not ready to withdraw for now. Why withdraw? And I can see the 
contract that's happening because a terror threat in the Sahel is also a threat for Europe. And I can see that Europe, Europe's best interest is to commit itself in the fight against uh, terrorism in the Sahel region. And the best interest is that Sahel not become a fertile ground for terrorism. And uh, it's not in the best interest uh, to become an Afghanistan in Africa here in the Sahel, which will threaten not only the north of Mediterranean, as well as the south of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean region. I can see that the European countries are committing more and more. I see Takuba impl being implemented. And why not the US? Since up, up till now, the contribute to the anti-terrorism uh, fight, but in a bilateral way. They are not committed with the G5 at the regional level. Therefore, I do not think that uh, France will withdraw now. And uh, for this, I cannot think at what's happened, what's going to happen if France withdraws, because that's not a, a problem now. I would like to thank you. OK. Thanks. Um, so with that, allow me on behalf of the Africa Center and our alumni to extend a, a deep gratitude to our two excellent panelists for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to highlight a couple of takeaways from today's conversation. So first, well, it's certainly true that there are challenges um, when it comes to coordination with regional actors and other mechanisms, financing and, and, and mitigating uh, civilian harm from its military operations. I'd like to commend what the G5 Sahel Joint Forces managed to accomplish in a relatively short period of time. Um, four years uh, might seem like a lot of time in comparison to the average news cycle, but as General Zanagi said earlier in our conversation, it's difficult to create something from nothing. And for those of us who study institutions and their development, um, you know, they take decades, I think, to become fully functional. And, and, and it's pretty impressive what uh, the G5 Sahel now being, you know, we heard fully operational, uh, 21 operations has been managed to, to achieve over the past uh, four years. Um, and I think even if, if it, you know, other countries might not necessarily be integrated directly with the G5 Sahel, um, some of the it, it, it mechanisms is experienced in terms of cross-border, uh, addressing cross-border terrorism could, could be a model and something that we've seen in other places uh, as well. Um, and I think that the G5 Sahel's experience uh, mirrors that of the African uh, peace and security architecture uh, writ large. Uh, the process of building a robust African-led peace and security architecture has been slow, it's been painstaking, it's been fraught with challenges, and there have been significant setbacks. But there is no doubt that the Africa's regional institutions are in a much better place now than they were uh, 20 or even five years ago much less you know in comparison to where they were you know in the in the 60s or 80s as as, as minister kamara uh, asks us to consider when we think about kind of what some of the root causes of a lot of these uh, conflicts and challenges in the sahel and and elsewhere are so with that broad perspective in mind i think there is a clear and compelling need to continue to support African-led efforts to develop the continent's regional peace and security architecture, the G5 Sahel among them. And an important part of that is the willingness to engage in frank conversations in order to share feedback and lessons learned. That's precisely the kind of space we as the Africa Center are seeking to provide uh, with these webinars. And it's been an honor to have, be able to uh, call upon such a strong network of esteemed colleagues and alumni to help us do so. Um, and to that end, I invite everyone here to con come continue the conversation with us uh, at the next webinar in the series, which is going to unpack the successes, challenges, and lessons learned from another AU authorized regional coalition, uh, the Multinational Joint Ta Task Force in the Lake Chad Basin. Um, until then, I wish you all a warm and productive afternoon on behalf of all of us here at the Africa Center.